Well, good morning again, Salem. Grateful that you're here this morning, grateful for all of our guests that are joining us. I feel like after that particular uh, uh, message bumper, I ought to like jump out of a box or something. I mean, it's just this ominous music that builds and then gets to this point of empty. So we're kicking off a new series this week as we begin our Lenten journey to the empty tomb. So you can probably figure out the play on words there a little bit of empty. We're going to be walking through the book of 1 Corinthians. And I love this opportunity to be able to walk through a book of the Bible. Sometimes we do uh, series that are based on particular topics and then we go and we find scripture that supports that particular topic and kind of walk that through with you. Other times we do what we did recently where we uh, walk through it's about time and walk through a very short piece of scripture and then kind of build that out. And in this particular series from now until Easter we're going to be walking through this book, Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth as we just allow his word to be able to speak to us and challenge us as we get to that point where we recognize where our hope comes from in the empty tomb. So we take that journey. I thought we'd just kind of dive into this whole idea of the word empty. And I think to myself, when I think in terms of empty, I think this would be a really bad spot to get to. Anybody ever run out of gas? I had this wonderful moment when my in-laws moved uh, down here to Texas, uh, probably, I don't know, maybe 10 years after Chris and I got here. And so, you know, I'm trying to prove to them that I'm taking good care of her, their daughter and their grandchildren. And so I'm driving them around the Houston area. I'm over on Cypress Rose Hill Road, showing them around as they're trying to figure out where they're going to live, all that kind of stuff. We're driving down the road and all of a sudden my car starts to sputter and it just shuts off. And I'm like, what's wrong with my car? And then I realize I am a complete doofus and just ran out of gas with my in-laws in the car. It's a good thing I got married years before that, or I think they probably would have kicked me out of the car and told me I wasn't uh, worthy. So here's the deal. When we get to this point, life is in a pretty bad spot. I think this probably more represents what life looks like when we get to an empty spot. Kind of beaten down, dirty, head hung down, and sort of feeling like we've got no gas left in the tank. My question to you this morning is this, have you ever gotten to the spot where you feel like you're running on empty? Depending upon what stage of life you're in, some of you are easily able to answer that and say yes, others of you are probably sitting in this room going, I haven't necessarily gotten to that spot yet. Well, I hate to tell you this, but hang on because the day's probably coming. We get to these spots where we just kind of get tapped out. And we've got nothing left to give. And we feel like all these things continue to put pressure on us. And I thought to myself, so what is it that gets us to feeling empty? And as I started asking questions and thinking about my own life, I got to the spot of realizing that these four categories, you might be able to think of some others. But I think this is a lot where we get empty. And I I began to realize this one for me sits at the very top. Because I find that sometimes my own expectations are so weighty that I get to the spot where when other people start putting expectations on top of mine, It just can feel overwhelming at moments. And so there's others in the room that probably feel like that. And then there's some of you that really don't care what anybody thinks. So expectations don't really get you down. But then some of the other things on this list maybe do. Things like self-absorption. I think this is an interesting one to me. Because look, we live in a world that, um, like it or not, last time I checked, the, the, the numbers out there are suggesting that there's between 7 and 8 billion people in the world. But sometimes we think that everything is about us. And so instead of looking through a really small lens, we tend to look at life through this really big lens as though everything that's happening in our life should affect everybody around us and everybody else should think that our problems are as big as you think your problems are. Sometimes we just got to gain a little bit of perspective, don't we? Be reminded of the fact that life was never intended to be easy and that there's challenges in this life and we live in a broken and a fallen world until Jesus comes back in the clouds or calls us home to heaven, we're going to have some challenges in life. Jesus was the one who said, in this world, you'll have trouble. And so sometimes when we get self-absorbed, we can get down to empty and have everything be all about us. And sometimes we just got to raise ourselves up. As a matter of fact, even counselors will say that people that are walking through um, the, the challenge of depression, that one of the best things that you can do when you're depressed is to force yourself to get up and go help someone else. Because it sort of forces you to get out of looking at your life and going, woe is me. And then there's this one, this whole idea of conflict. My goodness, can that eat up a lot of time, can it? And I don't want you to hear from me that I think relationships are what put you on empty. Because some relationships can be really filling. But you and I both know that there's relationships in our lives that can really just sort of weigh you down. I mean, there's people in your life that um, are people that sort of energize you. And then there's people that just sort of suck the life out of you. And so you've got you to live your life creating some boundaries on that kind of stuff. But conflict? Conflict. That'll eat your lunch. 
it'll tap the life out of you really, really quickly. And any of us that have walked through significant uh, seasons of conflict know what that can feel like and how empty you can get in that time. This one, this was probably the one that made me laugh the most. Um, but there's a reality to it. And as I was talking to people and people would sort of bring that one up and um, talk to me about how this could uh, cause them to feel empty, there were moments for me where I began to realize this one, this one kind of gets me as well. Uh, I find the, the longer that I lead and the longer that I live life, man, when people want to spend time talking about really trivial things, I think to myself, man, if that's the biggest thing you've got to worry about, I think you ought to probably count your blessings. And those of you that want to spend all of your time looking at the news and wrestling through all that and kind of assuming that maybe that that's uh, where you're going to get all of your, um, your, your ideas and, and figure it all out, let me just remind you that you are a spectator watching the news and you can't do a whole lot about it. So maybe if that thing's causing you to stress and putting you on empty, stop watching the news so much and fill your mind with something else. But here's the thing, trivial matters. The number of people that will come up to me and talk to me about stuff that just flat doesn't matter I'm finding myself the, getting to a spot where I just don't want to give a whole lot of time to this. Let's talk about the stuff that actually makes a difference, the stuff that's going to make a difference for eternity. I'll tell you what, I'm to, to the spot where I think to myself, if there's anything that I'm going to worry about in this life, it's whether or not my family's okay and where people are going to spend eternity. That's it. I don't know if there's a whole lot more to worry about because at the end of the day, this life's going to come to an end and my hope, as we just sang, is found in Jesus. So let's jump into 1 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth and he says, the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ, it's this great reminder to us of this is what makes us part of the church is the fact that we're sanctified in Christ Jesus and we're called to be as holy people. Boy, oh boy, sometimes we act like holy people and sometimes we act anything like it. And together with all those everywhere who call on the name of Jesus, their Lord and ours. I think as we kick off something like the book of Corinthians, a little bit of context is always helpful. So a little section of the world, we're looking at Greece here, and right down here is Corinth, and it's set in this really interesting spot where it's on two sides of a, uh, a couple of uh, canals, and so you think in terms of just the, the spot in the world that this is. It's a melting pot. This is a city, as the research that I did said that at the time of Paul, there's probably anywhere between 200,000 and maybe over half a million people in the city. So at that time in the world, pretty significant sized city. And it's a major trade port because of where it's at with the water, the ability for people to be able to get to it from around the world. It was a melting spot, spot of culture. There's Greeks there, there's Jews there, there's Italians there. Just the, all these people that have come together in many ways, if you wanted to compare it to a city today, you would probably almost suggest that it's like Vegas. And what I mean by that is it's this melting pot space, but it's also a space where people would go when people wanted to have fun. They would host major events in the city of Corinth. And so people would come there from all over the world. A little bit of what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. Some of the statistics out there, as I did some reading, suggested that probably more than 99% of the people in the city of Corinth had no idea who Jesus was and were anything but Christians. So think about that. So the Apostle Paul, if you want to do a little bit of research, those of you that like to do a little bit of reading, go back and read Acts 18 this week. Paul was in Athens and he, he migrated his way down from Athens and gets to Corinth and he spends a little bit of time there and he meets up with these people called Aquila and Priscilla who were fellow tent makers and starts to spend a little bit of time with them and he's talking about this guy named Jesus. And so imagine the world that we're living in, everybody. So Paul's traveling around the world and he's planting churches in Asia Minor, a way different world than what we're living in. And so he's walking in, people don't all know about Jesus. Maybe the word has traveled about this miracle man, this guy that had been crucified, some of those kinds of things. There's a little bit of word on the street that he rose from the dead, but not everybody's buying the story. And so Paul walks into the city, a city, the melting pot, where people don't necessarily want to deal with a guy like Paul. High, dense population, think in terms of like apartment living. So if something's happening in your apartment and you're talking about some things or singing some songs that nobody's heard before or talking about different stuff, people are going to know about it. And so here comes Paul walking into the city. And Acts 18 talks about the fact that he was walking into a spot where persecution was starting to break out. People didn't necessarily want to hear from him. And yet God tells him, Paul, you just keep preaching. Because I got you covered. And so for 18 months, 
The Apostle Paul plants this church. You might think that it would look like a place like Salem or some big mega church that explodes in the city of Corinth. They suggest that by the time Paul moved on to plant his next church that there were probably less than 100 people in the church in Corinth. So Paul moves on, he's doing his thing, and he hears some things are happening in Corinth, so he starts writing letters because it's the only way he knows how to be able to communicate in that day and time. And so this is one of the letters that he sent back to the church in Corinth. This group of less than 100 people in this big city trying to make a difference in the name of Jesus. And so what does Paul say? He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and what you do. And that there be no divisions. Can you imagine that? But that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Anybody think that's possible? I don't think it's entirely possible for us to be able to agree on everything in life. I mean, we're going to have different ideas as to the way we think we ought to solve certain problems. We're going to have different ideas as to how we ought to handle our HOA dues. Probably have different ideas as to the way your boss ought to make decisions. Those of you that are married, I'm guessing you don't always agree with your spouse. Kids, you don't always agree with your parents. But when we talk about being united... In the church? This goes back to those trivial things, right? I mean, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to stake our claim on? And what the Apostle Paul is doing is he's hearing words coming back to him. You know, just the the typical gossip train. He's hearing that things are happening in the church in Corinth. And and people are starting to talk about following one person and another person. And I follow this guy. I follow that guy. I think this guy's right. And the Apostle Paul's like, guys, just stop. Stop arguing about stuff that doesn't matter. And let's get back to the basics of who Jesus is and what he did for us and why that matters. I think the church today struggles with this. In the amount of conversations that we have over, you know, what songs we ought to play or what the temperature of the church ought to be or how we ought to spend our money and all those kinds of things, at some point we need to be about being an effective movement of people in the name of Jesus that they might know who Jesus is and what he did and why it matters. That's it. It's no divisions, Paul says. And then he gets to this, and I just think this is interesting. He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness. Let's just assume that we stop the, the passage there. How many of you think the message of the cross is foolishness? You wouldn't be here this morning if you thought it was foolish. Because you see, we're the people that go, to those who are perishing, it's foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, it's this. It's the power of God. But the Apostle Paul's trying to say, look, it's foolishness to those who are perishing because they don't get it. They don't even necessarily understand that they're perishing. They think that life is going just fine. They're showing up in Corinth and they're having a good time. Remember what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. Sometimes when you're talking to people about the brokenness of this life, maybe they haven't experienced enough brokenness in their life to know that it matters. And maybe they aren't to a spot where they recognize that nothing that they have left is going to solve the problem and they get forced to their knees. And sometimes it's when they get forced to their knees and there's nothing left. That's when they come face to face with Jesus. My wife and I are behind uh, a number of you. We uh, finally started watching this uh, show called The Chosen. I know a few of you have told me about it, so we started watching, we're through the first season, and one of my favorite scenes in there is uh, this moment in time where it goes back to the Old Testament, and Jacob is trying to build, uh, dig the well, and this guy that's in the area walks up, is sitting digging this well and saying, you can dig all you want, but you're not going to find any water, and they get to know each other just a little bit, and Jacob's looking at this guy, and this guy's asking him who he is, and why he's digging this well, and why he's here, and all this stuff, and they somehow get to a spiritual conversation, and And finally, the guy's asking Jacob about his God, and he says, so tell me about your God. And Jacob's like, well, I've never seen him. And the guy's like, oh, so you believe in an invisible God? And then he goes, well, you know, I mean, invisible, but yes. And then he goes, well, does he talk to you? Well, no. Um, Oh, so you you believe in an invisible God who doesn't talk to you? And he said, well, he did wrestle with me, and he messed up my hip. And so the guy goes, okay, so you believe in an invisible God who doesn't talk to you, and he messes with you. And then he goes, well, just hang on for a moment. And then he said, but he did make some promises to my, to my forefathers. And the, the guy finally goes, okay, so you believe in an invisible God who doesn't talk, who messes with you, and makes promises that don't get fulfilled for generations. Sign me up. 
And I thought to myself, what a great moment. And then in particular show, all of a sudden, Jacob hits water, but you know. But the point being is, is that's why this feels like foolishness, right? I mean, this idea of who in the world is going to believe in a God who supposedly created the world by speaking it into existence, has a floating zoo that supposedly saves the world, and then he sends his son, born of a virgin, do any of you understand biology, by the way, and then this guy supposedly dies, rises again, and if you put your faith in him, you're going to spend eternity in heaven? Sign me up? Imagine this message to these people. Sounds foolish. But for those being saved, it's the power of God. Paul pushes down, he says, where's the wise person? He's talking to the Greeks. Where's the teacher of the law talking to the Jews? Talking to the Greeks about their philosophers. You know what? God made the foolish the wisdom of the world. And so he just keeps pushing this thing down. He's trying to say, look, you, you Greeks, you put a whole lot of emphasis on education and philosophy and all these kinds of things. And you Jews... You're the ones always asking Jesus to show you something. You're the ones that say, hey, we know the Torah. Where do you look for answers? Do you look for the philosophers of this world? I asked some people some questions over the last couple of weeks, and these were the ones that came up. Anybody know this guy? Mr. Google? Anybody 50 on down knows that. The rest of you are probably trying to figure out who Google still is. Podcasts, you know, these are just little snippets of people that are, you know, talking. And some of these are really, really gifted people. Can speak well, speak eloquently. Not all of them are coming from a spiritual perspective. And sometimes we want to talk about, hey, have you heard this author? Have you... Heard that pastor, love the way this guy speaks, love what that guy has to say. And look, I'm not trying to say that this stuff is all bad. You can get some really good stuff off of here, but at some point, I'm saying, when you're looking for answers to life's big questions, the things that really matter, right? Not, how do I stain a fence correctly? But where do you go? My fear is that this is not the first place we go. I wish I could stand in front of you and tell you that every time I'm thinking about life's big questions, that that's always the first place I go. I think the longer I live life, it tends to be more and more the place that I, I lean on. But sometimes we look to these other places. We look to the wisdom of this world, and so we, we want to be able to say, we're not like the church in Corinth, but I think Paul could have written this letter to the church in Tomball, Texas. You know, are these the things that we're leaning on? Or are we going here? So the Apostle Paul asks this question. He says, Jews demand signs. Come on, Jesus, prove it, miracle man. The number of times the Jews would stand around and go, come on, Jesus, prove it. Show us that you're really the son of man. Show us that you're the son of God. Prove it. The Greeks? Hey, Jesus, where's your uh, diploma from the University of Athens? I think sometimes we do the same, don't we? What do we demand? What are we looking for? And I thought to myself, I think sometimes it's this, isn't it? In the 21st century church, the Western church, Northwest suburban Houston. Tim, you know why I show up at church? Because it helps make my life better. I mean, why else would I give my time to this or my dollars or any of it, right? I mean, like, what, Tim, if, if you're not helping my marriage get better, helping me be a better parent, helping me be a better boss, a better employee, whatever the case may be, like, make my life better. And if it's not making my life better, I don't have time for this. But guys, sometimes life is just hard. And sometimes being a part of the church and being a follower of Jesus doesn't make life better. It actually sometimes makes it harder. It's the road less traveled. 
So this isn't necessarily where we go. And, and sometimes, with, you know, just in the world we live in, you know, we, wanna, we want somebody else to demonstrate to us that this is worth talking about. So we're going to go get the five-star reviews. And here's the deal. Jesus, when he makes my life better, probably gets a five-star review. When he makes my life worse, probably one or worse. Prove it, Jesus. As Paul goes on, he says, but we preach... Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to the Jews. I mean, they're sitting and looking at this going, this is not what we expected, Jesus. And we just finished saying it's foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Powerful, powerful stuff. This is where it comes to. But I think we get to a spot, right, where we preach Christ crucified, but we, we step back from it as though, yeah, 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 Christ crucified, but now let's get down to what really matters. No, 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 no. Paul's saying, that's it. You want to stake your flag in the ground? Stake it on this one. Christ crucified. Because we get to a spot where we start thinking about ourselves differently. And the Apostle Paul finally pushes this thing down as he closes out chapter 1. He says, brothers and sisters, I want you to think for just a moment of what you were when you were called. So think about who he's writing to, right? I mean, this group of believers now in Corinth, this group, this little ragtag, small group of people that are kind of planting a church in the city. Who were you? I mean, maybe you had the the degree from the University of Athens. I don't know, but he's saying, just think about who you were. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. And not many of you were of noble birth. So who were you? question is this, how do you see yourself? If Paul was asking you the question today, hey Salem, who were you when God called you? Not many of you were wise, not many of you were influential, not many of you were from noble birth. In essence, he's saying, don't look at yourself higher than you ought. You see, God chose the lowly things in this world the despise things, the things that are not. Love this word. To nullify the things that are so that no one can boast before him. Think about this. Where do you put your hope? Where do you put your hope? I think if we're being totally honest with ourselves, sometimes we put it in ourselves, don't we? You know, we get to a spot where we think, you know, if I just work a little harder, if I learn a little more. And then sometimes when that doesn't work, then we get to someone or something else, you know, like maybe I can't do it by myself, so I got to bring someone else in, or, or, or maybe I need this tool or this something, right? And so we, we keep leaning into the things of this world, and what the Apostle Paul takes us back to is this, Right? Where are you going to put your hope? Paul closes the first chapter of Corinthians with this. Therefore, as it is written, if you're going to boast, boast here because of that. My hope and prayer for each one of us is that as we walk out of this place, we keep coming in here empty. It's part of what draws us in. Because this world starts to bear us down with the expectations, the trivial things of this life. And we keep coming back here time and time again and be reminded that the thing that fills us up is a God who loved us enough to die for us and rise for us and lives for us. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you for the privilege of being able to gather together in your house. We confess again this morning that sometimes we come here because we're looking for something. We'd like to suggest that those crazy Corinthians were the only ones that demanded things or asked for signs. God, sometimes we come here because we're just looking for you to make our lives better. We're coming here because we don't know where else to turn. Sometimes we're just expecting you to do some miracles. But God, this morning we we come again and 
lay ourselves at the foot of the cross and remind ourselves that Christ crucified. That's where the power is. And so we confess and apologize again for the times in which we make it more than that. And ask that as we walk out of this place again today that we're simply reinvigorated and filled up in the empty way of life that we sometimes chase after. And recognize that the one thing that gives us hope is the cross and the empty tomb. Thanks for loving us. Thanks for forgiving us. And thanks for the privilege of coming into your house again to be filled up. God, these things we give you thanks for. Amen. Yeah.